maybe before I, before I continue, so today, and um, uh, RNNs, language models, and uh, word vectors, maybe, yeah. But, I just, but then the core of this class is RNN. That's what Mr. Stan Duco told me, the current neural networks. So, but then I'll just like to introduce NLP and then if there's time, touch word vectors. Okay, so how many, how long do I have this start standing? Two hours. Ah, I thought I would teach him two hours. Okay, so, um, so Maximum I'll, to be I'll, I'll, I would like that this class is, I don't want to say as interactive as possible, but a little bit interactive. I know we might get to some parts where people might not want to talk or, but then like for this beginning, um, I would, I might ask questions and I would just like us to answer. By answering, I don't mean like, if I'm asking questions, I'm not asking Stanley, I'm asking, I'm not asking Stanley and yes, I this because, yes, I this because I'm asking everything on the call. Yeah, so, um, if you want to speak, then just raise your hand. Okay. So what is NLP? Uh, and I, I know I asked before if anybody was familiar with NLP, but uh, I would just like to know what our ideas are about NLP. Hello. Hi. Does anybody want so my team, NLP is basically trying to interpret um, languages into the computer, maybe English language, Igbo language, Yoruba language, Pidgin. It's basically trying to interpret it to the computer, anyway the computer can understand the language. That's basically what I understand by NLP. Sorry, can you come again? Okay. Sorry, can you come again? I didn't quite get it. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, I can hear you. Well, I said NLP I can is hear you. It's basically interpreting the language in the way the computer can understand it. Okay. Like yeah. English language, very Yoruba language, Igbo language, the various languages, interpreting it in a way or making it in a way that computer can understand the language. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yes, yeah, so, um, so natural language processing. NLP is short form for natural language processing. Natural language processing is uh, that combines computer science, intelligence, and linguistics. Yeah. The goal is to correctly determine, extract semantic content from natural language in order to perform useful tasks. Natural language, like he said, could be any language. Yoruba could be English, could be French, could be German, whatever language. Yeah. So, um, so that's what NLP is, yeah. And some example of tasks are machine translation, dialogue systems, yeah. Uh, we'll get to that. So understanding and representing. Um, um, so I think I'll... okay, yeah. So understanding and representing the meaning of language is. Could be very difficult. I mean, people say it a lot of times. Like NLP is hard. NLP is hard. NLP is hard, which is very true. Like very, very true. Uh, on my Twitter by I think my my um, cover photo is language is hard. Yeah, because language really is hard. Yeah. So uh, okay. So so this is just an introductory part of the class. So I'll be running through this slide like. This was like a whole class. This slide was like a whole class. So I'll be running through. There's some parts that I won't be talking. I won't, I won't be talking about. Some parts that are not in, um, important. So okay, okay. So these are like levels of natural language processing. So so for for NLP, your input could be text, could be speech, um, could even be sign language. Yeah. Uh, um, so we have. Um, so from your input, you do some morphological analysis. So morphological analysis are just. Um, um, understanding some set of rules that apply to language. It's like, uh, it's more of linguistic, uh, syntactic analysis, um, some syntactic, 
syntax for processing of your inputs. Um, syntax, semantic interpretation is basically extracting meaning from your inputs. Yeah, and discourse processing is, I think discourse processing is more of um, to processing your input or whatever, um, whatever your final um, goal is. Yeah, so these are some NLP applications. Uh, so spell checking, um, keyword search, information extraction from websites. Um, so, I mean, this, this um, simple ones are quite intuitive to understand. Spell checking, like, so if you see something like grammar, Grammarly, that helps you to correct your, um, your text, like saying your mails and stuff. Uh, information extraction from websites and um, text classification yes yeah, so, and um, um, sentiment analysis automatic summarization you have like a, a large text and then you want to just like get the summary of just understand what that text is about in like very few lines um dialogue systems dialogue systems are like um applications that are used in chatbots and uh and uh, um, stuff, machine translation, like your Google Translate, um, question answering systems. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay, let's talk about this. Um, so, why is NLP complex? Um, language representation is very complex. Um, language is very, very ambiguous so for example if you have a sentence like rima went to gary she said i'm tired so who is like who exactly is tired if your your language your model might think that gary is a person so how do you know we start um so human language interpretation variation like depending on like common sense contextual knowledge your background, your values, there are different ways you can interpret human language. Um, so, so, so these are some challenges with NLP. I'll just be touching on some. So bias, uh, we all know what bias is, yeah? I mean, not bias when it comes to um, weight and biases, like bias in like the literal term. Yeah. Um, like, okay. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Huh? What did you say? Okay. 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 If you have any questions, please, uh, just, uh, stop me. Okay, yeah, so bias, uh, so NLP for low resource scenarios. Low resource scenarios where you have like uh, um, very little data to train your uh, NLP models. Model explainability, trying to explain the output of your models, the results of your models, like why does your model predict this? Why, is, why does it do this? Cross-lingual learning is, um, cross-lingual learning is um, basically applying um, building models for different languages. Like say you have um, English, uh, English, French, uh, basically building models for different languages. It could be for machine translation. It could be for um, any other NLP task. Uh, okay. Evaluation, okay, this is too advanced. So not testing. Uh, okay, I think I'm done with this part. Okay, yeah, so that's that. Any questions from this part? Okay, no question. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so, okay. So typically, in natural language processing, the most common type of input that people use or people work on are what I would like like um, someone to answer that. 
like what are the most common type of inputs that people um, train their models on or build applications for? Words. Because mm, you can see words here. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. Uh, what are that? What are that types of inputs? Um, audio files. Okay. Yeah. Speech. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, then there's sign language. So. Okay. Yeah. So people work on like input on um, texts, data, and mostly and audio data, like. Uh, but most times you find out that people 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 that do research mostly or major am I, am I wrong majorly work on text data because it's easier to find text data than um, and I think it's easier to pre-process pre text data than audio um, than speech data. Yeah, so here we'll be talking about word vectors. Uh, so this is a this is a slide from um, Stanford's NLP course. Uh, so I used this slide when I was taking, uh, when I took the class last year. Yeah. Um, so it's fine if you don't understand anything about word vectors, like we'll just progress. So for this slide, we're just going to be talking a very, a very bit, because for RNNs, you need like some understanding of word vectors. Yeah, that's why I'm touching word vectors. So how do you represent the meaning of a word? Meaning of a word, say you have like a text, you have your text data, you have your text file. So how do you extract meaning from it? So literally, according to the, like the, the Webster dictionary, so the meaning of a word is, so, so here, you, I just understand that I'm not saying how do you represent a word, like how do you represent the meaning, like the semantic content of the data that you have. So the idea that, so you can, Webster dictionary says, the idea that, that is represented by a word or phrase. The idea that a person wants to express by using words or signs. The idea that is expressed in a work of writing or art. It's um, so So linguist, linguistically, you can think of meaning as, say you have a symbol. A symbol can be anything. It could be, um, it could even be text. It could be sign. It could be in uh, it could be speech, and then it um, it denotes like an idea or a thing, whatever. Um, okay, so here we have. Uh, You know what synonyms are? Hypernames are just like um, hypernames are hypernames are just um, words that are related to other words. Doesn't necessarily mean that they are synonyms. So a synonym of um, a synonym of um, of um, what word? Mm. So a synonym of, um, should I say, let, let's say just, let's say brilliant. We could say intelligent, yeah. But when you're dealing with things like living things, like say animals, you can't say what's the synonym of a dog or a synonym of a cat. But we know that cats or cats will have hyper names, like um, say animals that are related to it, yeah. So we could use this word net to find meanings of words yeah we could decide to do that but then there are problems with this word net it's great it's a very good resource but it misses some subtleties yeah so say we have something like proficient proficient can be a synonym of good but it's not always correct in like every context it could mean something else in another context so how do we encode this meaning into our data or into our models while we're training it. Um, so also, 
so it could um this one net misses like new me like you can't keep updating it every time i mean the, the new words new words uh probably spring up every day and then you can't like it's very hard to update resources like this and then also it's um, it requires human labor to create and adapt it's very it will be very strenuous and then it cannot even compute accu like accurately similarity of words yeah so how do we represent words so now we can see that we're dealing with um so for now we're dealing with text we're, we're talking about text data do we understand have i lost anyone have i lost anyone okay i assume that i haven't okay so how do you represent words here? So representing words. So we understand that you cannot just have a model and then just throw, say you have like a large text and then just throw it at your model like that. that uh, oh yeah, oh, I want to do machine transmission. No. Oh yeah, this is the parallel data that I have. Oh yeah, um, take this as input. Give me my translated stuff as output. Like the, the computer will not understand. If you just pass in, you can't pass in text to computers. Like computers will not, they don't, computers don't understand literal meanings of stuff like that. You have to represent them with numbers. That's how computers operate here. So how do you represent words? So in traditional NLP, so traditional NLP is like natural language processing before 2013. Yeah. So we represent we regard words as discrete symbols, yeah? So we represent words with one hot vectors. We all know what one hot vectors are, right? Because I need someone to say yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Kosi. Okay, so, um, so one hot vectors. So say you have like a data of, say you have data of like, say, 500 words, yeah? You have a, say you have a data of 500 words. You have a vector dimension of 500. And then for each row in your matrix, sorry, a, you have a, a matrix rather. So for each row, row vector in your, in your matrix, you'd um, wherever, um, a particular word is whatever position a particular word is. You represent that word as one, and then every other word they represent that you represent them as zero. So the problem with one word vector using what one word vectors. So if other people don't use it though, people use what one word vectors. Like in fact, when I work currently, I use one word vectors. People use one word vectors. But the problem with one word vectors is that you can't measure similarity between just so just having so if i have like two vectors now so i so see i see this motel and hotel if i have these two vectors how do i even measure similarity between these two vectors like the data is very sparse do you understand so we can so so we can try to encode similarity in like the vectors that we in what vectors typically so what vectors being um vector of motel and vector of hotel so we can so we know that we're still looking at how to represent words, how to represent words. Yeah. So we can choose to represent words by their context. So there's this popular saying that um, of you know a word by the company that it keeps. Yeah, so a word's meaning is given by the words that frequently appear close by. So you have you have a sentence of five words, yeah. The, the last word or the, the word, the word, the third word for you to infer the meaning, you can infer the meaning from the words that are around it, the, the four words that are around it. So you can see when a word W appears in a text, its context is the set of words that appear nearby within a fixed size window. A fixed size window is, a fixed size window is best example, government debt problems turning into So a fixed size window, a, a size, a window of two will be 
turning into a window of two will be turning into and crisis as turning into and crisis as a window of three will be problems turning into and crisis has happened so i uh, considering so this this words around banking will provide context as to what should be there so let's say banking is missing and we're trying to predict what banking is they're telling us that by knowing the words that are around it, we should be able to predict that ah, this should be banking. So what are word vectors? So we build a dense vector. So we understand that previously we had just one hot vectors for our words. And then we, we complain that there's no way we can encode similarity. There's no way we can really find similarity between two different words or different words, yeah? So we build a dense vector for each word so that it is similar to vector of words that appear in similar contexts. So we can call, um, we can call word vectors um, word embeddings or word representations, yeah? So it's just so, so the goal is that when you plot different word vectors in space, so you just plot it, use your math project to plot like word vectors that you've learned for like say a text, a particular text. Mm -hmm. what's that similar or what's that appear close to each other in your text should have um should be plotted close to each other like their vectors should be plotted close to each other in space or what in whatever plot that you have so this is an example now so if you look at this now we can see you can see this word so this is like plotting word vectors in space so let's see, so we have this word vector now, expect. So this is the vector representation of this word, expect. So if you look at expect, you see think, you see say. If you check the word vector of think and say, you would see that it is very, very similar to this word vector of expect. So to compute word vectors, yeah, there, there's uh, there are, I think there are different methods to compute word vectors. There's word to vec, there's fast text, there are different methods, yeah. So word to vec is uh, is a framework. Let's just say it's a framework or an algorithm for learning word vectors. So what's the idea? Uh what's the second thing? So the idea is that you have like a large, a large data, a large corpus of text, yeah? So you represent every word in your vocabulary. So vocabulary is, so let's say you have 500,000 words. The vocabulary is the number of unique words that you have in the 500,000 words that you have. Number of unique words. Let's say you have just 100,000 unique words. That's what you use as your vocabulary. So every word in a fixed vocabulary is represented by a vector. So you go through each position in the text, which has the center word C. So center word C, if we go here, this is our center word banking. So center word C and the context words O. These are context words, these words on the sides. So use the similarity of the word vectors for your context and your outside words. Calculate the probability of the outside words given your context words. And you keep adjust, adjusting these word vectors to maximize this probability. It, it might sound overwhelming, but just relax, we'll explain it. So like I said, you have a large corpus of text. You have a window size. So let's see this example now. Oh, okay. I'm just basically what what vec does is that given a particular context word, you want to predict the surrounding words, and vice versa. Given surrounding words, you want to predict the context word. So here we can see our, our center word is into. Our center word is into yeah, and our context are uh, um. Context words are probably problems turning 
banking crisis as. So given these words, these outside words, we should be able to pre um, predict this word into. So we we come we do this over. So we do this. See, say go through each position. See, so we do this over all the words in your text. You keep shifting. So if we move, if we move here, after we've completed the probability of this word, we'll move to banking. So for banking here now, if we're using a window of two sides, a, a window a, a window of size two, we'll consider just turning into and crisis us. So you keep doing that. So like I, I said before, the objective is to predict context words within a fixed a fixed side, given the center word. Um, so, um, so yeah. So what we make has two variants here. Yeah? So the skip gram and the continuous bag of words. So, so there's just so skip gram is when you predict context words giving your center word and then your continuous bag of words is when you predict center word from your context word. like i think the best the i used to mix skip grammar and continuous bag of words but once i just understood that continuous bag of words means you are trying to predict the word from a bag of other words around it to be easier it was easier for me to understand so okay so that's all we'll touch on word vectors so there are other parts that are interesting if you want if you are interested but i don't know if they are really relevant these days given that people have people like google now have trained they have they have, they have trained word vectors already on very large like on like billions of texts yeah so what people do these days is so you know how you use a pre-trained model you know we know we don't know what transfer learning is so like try and transfer parameters from like a pre-trained model to like a a smaller model so you initialize your small model with like parameters that you've learned from like bigger models so what people do these days is that because so because um we all know that like to train machine learning models we need very, very large data yeah so if you want to represent words in your if you want to represent words very well in whatever application you are building or something whatever model you are building you need very large data to estimate the probability of all words in your text and usually we don't have such data so what you can do is what google and facebook and the likes have done for us is so they've trained they've trained um word vectors on very very large um corpus such that if you want to work on any application or whatever you can initialize your word embeddings with those pre-trained vectors that they've trained so that's why i'm saying all this um understanding how to train um word vectors might not be important for this class but if you want to learn it yeah you can can go and learn, but it's not in the scope of this class. So, any questions? Uh, moving to earnings now. Hmm. So, should I ask questions? So, what I are what questions? Okay. What okay. is that? Okay. What is that? What is everyone chatting? So what okay. is the couples? I've been hearing you say couples. Oh, yeah. sorry. Okay. So in <laughs> what you like does everybody have an idea what the couples is? Anybody wants to answer? Like a dictionary of words, I guess. Like a like a dictionary that has words. That's what the couples is like. That's what I think it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so a corpus could be a dictionary. A corpus is typically a collection of 
your da- of text data of your data data you want to choose to train your model that's what we call a corpus so i think i don't know which is singular or plural either cochra or corpus but they both mean the same thing yeah so it's just the collection of texts or data that you want to use to train your nlp model that's what we call a corpus a text corpus so i think it's collection of data that you want to use to train your model your nlp model yeah So we have some people in this chat. I mean, we're just seven. Oh, that's cool. Some people have not talked since. Yeah. So what are word vectors? What are word embeddings? Hey, Jesus. I, I can't hear you. There's one Femi boy. He doesn't speak. He should talk. Wait, I think I saw him on the group chat, but I can't see any Femi on the. Yeah. Call. Can I, can everybody hear him? Cause I can't. OJ, OJ, your volume is low. Like we can't hear you, OJ. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah I said there's one Femi. Probably my internet. Please, can you turn? Okay. I'll type in, can you type into the chat? I can't. I think it's probably not internet. He said there's a Femi boy that is not. Um, I don't know, boy. I know it's something that has to do with Femi. Uh, you said. I think I grabbed. You said people are not talking, and I said there's always one Femi. He doesn't talk. He'll just be watching. Wait, is, is Femi in this call? Oh, he said. He's... Yes, now nah, Oluwa Femi Lawa. Oh, oh, oh. So, hello, Femi. He will not still talk. Don't mind him. He's, he's yeah, very shy. Question? He's like Buari. <laughs> yeah, so back to my question. What are word vectors now? Okay. What vectors? So, are, no. What vectors? What vectors are mm-hmm. like when you represent the word as a vector? Because it, your your computer cannot take in words; it has to take in numbers. So, what vector? I think is basically embedding the embedding the word as a number. I guess. Yeah, as a, like, as, a yeah. as a vector of numbers. Yeah. That's what I understand. Yeah. Thank you very much. God bless you. Well, I have a question. I have a question. Okay. I'm the, okay. I think the word vector. Each word had like. 10 numbers like 10 rows so it's like yeah. so those 10 rows are for one number like the 10 yeah it could be so yo are you done yeah i'm done i'm done that's just basically okay okay so it could be it could be um it could be it could be any dimension yeah your your word vector could be any dimension you could have a word vector of 10 dimension but usually Vectors of higher dimensions usually perform well. Yeah. So say something like portrait vectors, something like glove. Glove has hundred, hundred, and it's, it's actually even dependent on whatever you are trying to perform, whatever you are trying to do. There's no such thing as having a word vector as one value. Like, you're not learning anything. If you plot that in space, you might not get any um, reasonable, like there's no reasonable sense in doing that. So usually vectors are usually like of very high dimension. So like you can see, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But this the word vector, this banking, this banking word vector is a 10 D um, vector. That answer your question. Yeah, it did. It did. So so like for example, the banking word vector now was Let's assume that they just basically those three sentences where banking was in. So it was gotten from those three sentences, not just one. These three sentences, okay. Like the yeah, these the three sentences, yeah, those ones. So like the banking was very Yes, so okay, yeah. So okay, maybe because I'm asking. Yeah, so so 
Yes, yes, yes. So given that these three sentences are in your text data, do you understand? So let me go back to 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 this. So we can see that here now they are trying to predict center. I would give in this yeah. So like if so if you know if you actually your your language your machine there, so all the words in your in your in your text data dependent on the number of the, the window size the window size of your algorithm or whatever for each example so each sample let's say this is the beginning of our okay let me use this okay let's use this. let's say this is the beginning of our beginning of our uh, uh, text this our, our text data starts from problems your first input, if you're using the, the continuous bag of words model, your first input will be problems, turning, banking, crisis. And then your targets, what you're trying to predict will be into. No? Your second input example will be turning into crisis and us. What you're trying to predict will be banking. Then you keep going like that. Yeah. So usually you can initialize your your um, vectors you can initialize them randomly. I mean, that's what you should do if you are training um, word vectors from scratch. So you initialize it like these vectors randomly, and then when you back propagate the the model. So for instance, if your model predicts um, um, out of instead of into, model compares gets over that. I like compares. Okay, uh, it's not. Um, output to to be input computes the loss and then propagates and then why you, as you keep training your model the model should eventually learn to predict into so you, you do this over all like all of the text that you have in your data so the goal is that at the end of this mm, you should have like very rich word vectors that basically represent all like that represent all of the um, unique words that you have in your data so for each unique word you have like a specific a specific vector vector for itself so going back to your your previous question so if you have all of these sentences in our word in our text at the end of the day this um this word vector should represent banking in this instance it should represent banking in this instance it should also represent banking in this um, text so, are we good yeah i guess i, I have I one question okay i'm listening how, how do you prepossess uh, text data. You use normal normalization or standardization. How do you come about that? So there are different ways to preprocess text data. Yeah. Um, okay, I have that on the slide anyway. But there, there are different ways to process text data dependent on what your application is. So like I said before, you could use one hot vectors. You could use one hot vectors. Um, oh, sorry. Processing, not um, not um, representation. So, so processing text data also like there are different ways. Um, you could use um, libraries such as um, NLTK, and processing your data is is with is application specific, is model specific. Like, whatever um, in like whatever model that you plan to you plan to use so it's just converting your text to something that like it goes hand in with representation actually so it's converting your text to something that your computer would understand and these days you have um LTK, you have stuff like spacey you have you have like um different libraries that can you to 
um, do that. Let me just, um, let me see if I have this slide there, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, so like I said, converting your text to a meaningful format for analysis. So you can use an LTK, Spacey, TextBob, Jensen, depending on whatever um, this thing. So there are different types. Um, um, tokenization. So to represent your text, yeah. So let's say you have, um, so let's say you have like a text data like of 100,000 sentences, yeah? You can't feed that directly into your, your model. Yeah, you have to break it into like, so you could break it into like sentence, you could break it into words, you could break it into characters. Uh, that's what we call, that, that's what we call tokenization. I'm, I'm just going to run through this slide because I still have a lot to cover in uh, for RNN. So that's what we call tokenization. Uh, so there are different other things, top word removal. Um uh so so when you have like um so when you have like words that are highly frequent in your corpus, yeah, words that really have like that directly do not affect your model. So words like so in some applications you can have words like um like verbs like um um words like d, words like is. There's some verbs that would not make any meaning, that would not really affect um, your model prediction. So you can remove those words to reduce the um, computational expense of your model. So there's stuff like um, like stemming. Stemming is reducing your um, your reducing your um, a word to the to its base form. So some um, like I said before. Text processing is very specific. It depends on like whatever application you are do, you are using. So there are some applications that you would like for instance machine translation. In fact, most recent applications you really don't need some of all these processing techniques. The one that is like usually very important is tokenization, like tokenizing your texts. Uh, uh, yeah, tokenizing your texts. Yeah. So, um, so all these other ones, lemmatization, overstemming. It's just, in summary, um, converting your text to a form in which you can um, analyze it or um, pass it into your data, depending on whatever application you are trying to you are trying to work on. Uh, okay. And it's useful because, like I said, text, like I said before, text data is could be very, very ambiguous. And then you don't want to feed in things that are not necessary, like things that are not important. So it's it's just um, one process that leads to is like is that process that leads to your text representation. That's why I say it goes hand in hand. Before you can before you can build word vectors for your text, you have to first tokenize them, tokenize your text data, and then get the unique words from the data that you've tokenized. Yes, so I'll just uh, move to RNN. Oh, okay. So, we are on your networks. I'm sorry, just one more question. Uh, okay. That one that the analyze takes to see whether someone is happy or not, that one sentimental analysis or whatever. Yes, yeah, sentiment it. analysis. Thank yeah. Okay. Yeah. So semi analysis is a it's a what's it called? It's an is a form of application of um of NLP. Uh, okay. I just wanted to know thanks. Yes, sentiment analysis. Okay, yeah. So to start with RNNs, we're going to build off from language models. Yeah, that would 
it will help us understand why RNA is in the first place. Why is RNA in the first place? So let's go. So language modeling, yeah. Um, like the name implies, or maybe name doesn't imply it, anyways. <laughs> but it's uh, so it's a task of predicting um, a word that comes next, giving a particular like giving a a set of words. So if you got, if you look at this example, the students opened there. So you want to predict the next word that should come after there. Intuitively, it could be books, it could be laptops, it could be ex exams, it could be minds, yeah? So language modeling is such that given a sequence of words, X1, X2, up to whatever X that you have, you want to compute the probability distribution of the next word, XT plus one. These are the next words, these are the previous words, X, X1, X2, X3. Where XT plus one can be any word in your vocabulary, Vocabulary, you understand what vocabulary is? Explain that before. So a system that does this is called a language model. So you can also think of language model as a system that assigns probability to a piece of text. Probability to a piece of text, you have a large text, so you want to like get probability distribution over all of the words in that particular text. So if you have, um, if you have a, a text, with words x1 to xt. The probability to the text according to, of that text according to language model is the, the products of all um, continual probabilities of previous texts given a specific text, text. So say you have, so say you have um, the number, the number of, your, of text in your, um, of words in your text is t. So complete probability of, of all these words, you multiply probability of x1, then by probability of x2, giving x1, by probability of x3, giving x2, by probability of x3, giving x2, by probability of x4, giving x3, like that. So we, we use language models every day. So, I mean, we're all familiar with this here, uh, network prediction, when you're trying to type um, on your phones. I'll meet you at the, the, the model, the, your keyboard um, uh, or your keypad predicts airport, predicts cafe or predicts office for you. Also, your Google search, when you try to search for something, the model, your, it gives you options, yeah? So how do you learn uh, language models? So in the predict learning era, to learn a language model, they'll use an n-gram language model. So what's an n-gram? An n-gram is a collection or a chunk of n consecutive words, consecutive words that come after each other, yeah? So we have different types of n-grams. We have unigrams, we have bigrams, we have trigrams, we have foregrams. So an example of unigrams are just um, unigrams are just words, are just uh, um, single words. Bigrams are consecutive, two consecutive words. So say, given this example, the students open there. The unigrams there are the students opened there. The bigrams there are the students. Students opened opened there. The trigrams, uh, the students opened, students opened there. And then the um, foreground is students opened there. If you have more words, it goes on like that. So how do we learn? Um, so the, the idea of um, n-gram language models is to collect statistics about how frequent different n-grams are, and then use them, use that to predict the next word. Don't forget that the goal of language model is to predict the next word. So we assume that the next word that you are trying to predict for n-gram language models is dependent on the previous words, the preceding words, the preceding n minus one words. So for instance here, uh, we assume that, so 
So we want to predict the student open their dash. So to predict what dash is, we assume that dash is dependent on these words that have come before it. These students open there. So how do we um, how do we um, um, model our language uh, models? So you obtain the probability of an n-gram over the probability of n minus one gram. I will explain that. I'll explain that in the next slide. So basically, you want to count these probabilities like in like the whole text data that you have. So let's say, so an example to better understand this part. Let's say we, we want to learn a four gram language model. So the right sent like the full sentence here is, as the proctor started the clock, the students opened their we are trying to predict dash. So if we're learning a four gram language model, because we said here, the probability of this n gram is equal to the probability of, is dependent on rather, the n gram, the, um, what we're trying to predict is dependent on the n minus one grams that have come before it. So here, if we're using a four gram language model, to predict this, would be looking at four minus one that's three preceding words before it so giving so we're trying to predict this dash giving this only student open there while forgetting the other words that have come before it as long as it doesn't fall into the the four minus one n minus one gram we don't consider it so what do we do so we we obtain the counts of so we look, so you have your, da your data. So you look at your data, you obtain the counts of, so obviously students open there would have happened different times in your couple. So let's say one time in your first line, you have students open their books. In your, in your hundredth line, you have students open their head, uh, their minds. In your um, fifth line, you have students open their something, yeah? So you check the number of times that you have students open there with a particular word. So if it's books, you find the number of times. Let's say um, in um, let's say students open their books occurred four hundred times, mm? and then students opened their uh, mind occurred two hundred times. You collect this individual count. Then you now count the overall number of times that only students opened their occurred. I hope I'm not losing us. So let's say in our text data now, students open their accord 1,000 times. This means that students open their accord with different words 1,000 times. But students open their books accord 400 times out of this 1,000 times. So the probability of predicting books here will be 400 over 1,000. If students open their exams accord 100 times, probability that this next word is exams will be Zero, um, 100 over 1,000, that's 0 0.1. So now, should we have discarded this context? This, um, as the proctor started the clock, the students opened their dash. Should we have discarded this context? Do we think that this context would have added some meaning to what we should have predicted? These are, I'm asking everybody. Yes. Should we have, the question is, should we have discarded it? Yes or no? no? Should no. we have discarded it? No. Why? Why? Because it gives the, the students open their more context. Make sure that. Hey, pardon? Um, please, if you are not talking, can you just mute yourself, please? So that we don't have. Yeah, okay. I'm listening. Yeah. I said because it gives it gives them the end gram cost um, context. Like why why are the students opening their books? So it's it gives the whole statement more context. 
like it gives the students open their more context. Like yes. adding the adding yeah. the, 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 the more context. That's yeah, right. So so we know here we have books and exams. What 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 would what would what should the answer most likely be? Considering the whole sentence, if the whole if the whole sentence is as the proctor started the clock, student opened there, it should intuitively it should be exams, not books. Because that's where, like when someone starts a clock, proctor, I think proctor is like say an invigilator or something. But because our engram language model did not consider this, it only considered students open there. Then what happened? It did not give, it did not assign the right probability. Yeah. So I probably most likely predicting the wrong thing in this instance. So engram language models have problems. Big problems, sparsity problem. The first problem is, what if students open their so yeah, W here means any word, like any word that the part, your particular engram has occurred with in your text data. So what if students open their W never occurred in your data at all? So to, so um, let's understand something. Once you build your language model, yeah, you can use it for different things. Yeah, yeah, you can use it to, um, to you can use it to um, predict, like to make predictions after training, yeah. So what if after training now, we now want to use it to um, generate text now. Mm -hmm. So we're generating text. This is we're generating text word by word, word by word. So we now have the students open there and they want to predict the next word. But in the data that you use to train your model, students open there, do not with there with something with another word, do not occur at all. It means that typically you assign the probability of zero to that occurrence, which is not optimal at all. Because you could have scenarios where students open there will occur. But typically, we've already assigned the probability of zero because that did not occur in our training data. So a solution that they proposed is adding like a small delta value to every count. So even if it doesn't occur, just add a very small value to it. So um, another problem is what if, so here we're talking about what if students open their W never occurred. Right. So what if students, this engram, students open there, did not even occur at all. What do we do? We just use a, a solution called back of, back of. We forget the, we forget the, um, the last word in our engram or the first word in our engram. Should I say first or last? The first, the last, the first one now, engram students. Then we focus on open there. We use open there to make the next prediction. If open there does not now occur, we forget opened and then use there to make such prediction. But if there does not occur, then we can now use this our um, obviously there there should occur. But if it doesn't occur anyways, we we'll use this our smoothing method where we add like a very small uh, probability value to every word so that at least even if it's zero point zero one. Model can say assign some specific probability to it. Another problem with engram language models is storage problem. It's very computationally expensive. You have to store count of all your engrams that you've seen in your corpus. Like you can imagine how many, um, how many that will be out. And if you increase the number of your engrams, or your you have a very large number of corpus, your model will be very, very, it will be very, very large which is which doesn't make sense so this is how engram language models are used in practice you can build a simple trigram language model over a so over a 1.7 million word couple so this couple is called realtors it's a business and financial news couple so this was trained by the creator of this slide i reckon um so this is just this is text generation. So given given um, after training on this word corpus, 
She's not trying to. So, so the way text generation works is that you have a start word or a start sentence. A start word, yeah, a start word or a start sentence, yeah. So, given that start word, you, your your um model will start generating. So, to generate the next word, generate the next the um, next word, like goes on like that. We we'll talk about that. So, yeah, the start word is today. D. So, after training a model, she now put the start word as today. D. So. Using the n-gram language model, it assigned probabilities of 0 0.153 and 0 0.153 to company and bank. To company and bank. So this is where we this another dispersity problem occurs. This is very very small. Like, if I want to predict the this as um, the next word, I should have a higher probability. The reason I'm getting this low probability is because we have very large corpus and we have very large corpus and we have probably a very small um number of occurrence of our various n-grams yeah so it's 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 very um it's not efficient basically it's not efficient because it, it assigns very very little probabilities when you have very small very large corpus and this is because of this because of sparsity in like the count so here so use this generate text. So conditioned on today D as the start word. You sample. So once you get the the probability distributions of um, different um, the different n-grams, you sample, and so you can decide to pick the highest. Yeah, MP or argmax, pick the highest one. So yeah, she picked price. You sampled and price was um, was chosen. So. We chart price chosen. It's a uh, today the price. So the the model predicts the, the model, so we assume that the model predicts price today the price. So given after predicting price, mm, so here we can say that we are using a two gram language model, right? So after predicting price, we'll forget today. We would consider only D and price. We predict of after this, we'll forget to D and D. We'll predict, we'll use price and off to predict the next word. We'll predict gold. So now we have today the price of gold. And you keep going on like that, depending on whatever n gram they are using. If we're using a three gram, um, sorry, we're using a three gram here. If we're using a four gram. It will be today the price. We use today the price to predict of. We use the price of to predict gold. Then we use price of gold to predict the next word. So if you go on like this, you can predict. You can predict a, a an entire. Um, uh, you can predict a, a large number of uh, of words. So here. After going on, she predicted this. Today, the price of gold per ton, while production of shoe lasts and shoe industry. The bank intervened just after it considered and rejected an IMF demand to review depleted European stocks. Set 30 end and um, primary 76 CTS a share. It's so grammatical, like no errors at all. Like all the words are intact, but it's incoherent. It doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense now. And then if we increase, um, um, so um, for us to be able to generate more coherent text, we want to add more context when predicting, yeah, or when training our model. So we'll say, okay, instead of using three gram language models, why can't we use five gram? Since five gram language, five, five, um, five grams will add more context. So in, in that case of um, the proctor something, 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 maybe if we had a five gram language model, the model would have been able to get uh, occurrence of clock. And maybe that would have made us predict exams, yeah? But if we increase the number of N, as you increase the number of your N-gram, your spacity increases. Because you're looking for occurrence of five consecutive words in your corpus. Like how hard can that be? You all, you mostly have zero for most occurrences, yeah. So the I think the 
the um the right number of engrams to use i think the highest should be three or four yes i think the highest should be four you should not go beyond but you shouldn't if you don't try to do 10 gram you won't like you your model will not even it won't even work at all you get very very poor predictions and then your data will be very very your counts will be very very sparse so that is n-gram language model so given the n-gram language models are problematic they now said okay well, let's look at neural language models so neural language models so if we recall that our language modeling task here you have your input a sequence of words and your output is the probability distribution of the next word you're trying to predict the next word given a sequence of words yeah so what about considering a window-based neural model? Um, so NER, name and recognition is just um, predicting the entity of say a particular word. So let's say you have something like uh, um, Lagos. Lagos is um, a location. So you have something like um, um, a name, say um, Stanley. Stanley is a name, so that's the named entity of a particular word. Say you are trying to, you just like when you define a noun, a noun is the place of any person, name or thing, or something like that. Sha. It's the entity, the named entity that is associated with that particular word. So in this case here, um, so forget about we saw this applied to name density recognition in lecture three. Forget about lecture three. We don't do lecture three yet. But this is just showing us how we can build a language model with um, how we can build a language model with neural networks. So, um, so this is what name density recognition looks like. Anyways, you have museums in Paris are amazing, yeah, and you want to. Um, predict the name density of Paris, yeah? So you'd collect the word embeddings of this, um, collect word embeddings of um, this, um, all these words, concatenate them and use to predict a, the name density, which is location in this case. So for a neural language model, we use a window, a fixed window, just like we used a fixed window for, maybe not window, but we didn't use a fixed window for it. Just like we use a fixed window for word vectors when we were talking about word vectors earlier. So our previous, uh, our previous example applies. As the proctor started the clock, the students opened their dash. So our fixed window size here is four. We forget what has come before. We forget this other, um, we discard this other word. We focus on just the students open there. This is not n grammar. This is a um, neural language model. So what neural language model does is that to predict the next word, you collect the word vectors. You know, we've, talk, we've talked about word vectors before. You add the word vectors of this, all these previous words in your fixed window. So this we have a fixed window of four. So to to make to predict what should come next, we we'll add these embeddings. We we'll, we we'll get these embeddings. Yeah. So you can get these embeddings from using pre-trained vectors, like I said before, or you can initialize them randomly. And as your model learns, it's it learns to um, to associate the right word vector to each word. So you get the word embedding of D, student, opened, and there. So here we want to assume that the word embeddings are one word vectors. Then you concatenate this embedding. So you can either concatenate the embeddings or you find the mean of the embeddings. And then you pass it into a hidden layer basically transforming it like with a linear function yeah that's apply a weight to your embedding and add a bias you'd um 
um, pass into a, a, a hidden layer, then you compute um, this thing on it. So to get the probability of the next word, whatever output you get from it, you just um, compute like a soft max over it. So soft max will just give, so depending on the number of words in your vocabulary, soft max just gives you like relative probabilities. So here we can see that all the words in our vocabulary is from A to Z, yeah? But the highest, um, the highest probabilities are books and laptops. Um, yeah. So we so after computing this um three. So you do the students opened. The highest probability here should be With yeah, rather. After getting the, you now discard this. The, you focus on only students open, but we understand that for um when training models here, yeah, we have our targets and you have your your outputs. A bit sorry, you have your input and you have your target. Your target. So when training your model, what what it does is it takes this. Depending on the um, depending on the size of your fixed window. So let me go to a longer let me go to a longer um, example. So let's say this is what this is what our text looks like. This and um, like this text. So what we'll do your first sample, like I said for word vectors here, that your first sample will be used today the price of the price to predict of. The difference between this one with word vectors is that when we're learning word vectors that time, we're using so um surrounding words so you consider words on the right and words on the left but here yeah, we're considering only words that have come before because you don't know what is coming next you're trying to predict what to, what will come next so if you have your window size of of three you get the embedding of today get the embedding of the get the name of price concatenate it or find the mean um inside into a linear a linear layer get the source mass over all or overall occur, um, um, words in your vocabulary and use that to predict of. If it doesn't predict of. So here now, of is your target. Today the price is your input. So if your model doesn't predict of, as it should, if you predict gold, you calculate the loss between what that's predicted and then the right prediction. And then you backpropagate that loss with respect to your input. So you go on like that, depending on your window size. So why is neural language model good? It's better than the n-gram language model. Why? Because here yeah, you don't have problems of sparsity. You don't have to store any n-gram at all. You're basically just using different weights, different embeddings from different words. You're not computing any count at all. I just see what the model is learning to make predictions. But the problem is that um, if your fixed window is too small, like if you go back to this example now, see that the model is still predicting books instead of exams, as it should, because the fixed window is small. So with you know, good models, your fixed window is still small. And if you enlarge the window size, say, the window can never be large enough. It can never ever be large enough. Yeah? And that important problem is that the weights that you learn for your inputs are different. There's no symmetry. There's no symmetry. Like we understand what we're trying to predict something based on what has come before. And there should be a symmetry between each of these inputs. There should be a way where that D contributes to students, students contribute to open, open contribute to D, so that it give, it, it's, it encodes all this information and gives us a, the next word. But then there's no symmetry. Well, let me see, every time D occurs in your sentence, it's learning a different weight entirely for the operation. Students learn a different weight entirely. So we need a neural architecture that can pre-process any length inputs that you give it, not just a fixed window size.
any length inputs. So that's why, that's what bets this um, family of neural network called RNN. So the RNN has three parts. You have your input, you have your hidden state, and you, out, you have your output. The significant thing about the RNN is that with the RNN, you encode information along, across your data, such that you, such that um, on each time step, so a time step is each, let's say this line, this is a time step. Each occurrence or each inputs, let's say this is a time step. So you, each time step, each input contributes to, to every other input that you have in your, in your data. So the way it works is that you take this input into your, um, into your, this thing, hidden state. So you can have like, so, so if we, if we look at this, um, this one now, here you have, um, you have the students open there. You have different weights here. You now concatenate it and try to predict here. There's no symmetry, like I said. But here, you have as many hidden states as you have as many inputs. So it's called hidden states because it's because each each state is comp computed. Um, it's called hidden states because it's it mutates over time, rather. So it's like having several versions of the same thing. So it improves over time, yeah? So each, each, each hidden state is computed based on the previous ones. I hope you understand. So here we have x1, x2, x3. So you take x1, you pass it into this um, hidden state, and then you compute your output, y. Then you get the weights the um, weight from this hidden state, you add it to your next input to compute, to, you add it to your next input to obtain your, your second target. So you can see that the weights are improving over time. So you're using the same, you're learning the same weights across your data. Here we have different weights for each, but here they're just improving on the weights. So you take this, so you can see that for X2 now, X2 has encoded information from X1. So you move on like that. So X1, you get to X3. X3 now has information from X2 and from X1. You move on like that across all of your data. So the idea is to apply the same weights repeatedly over all of all the occurrences in your data such that, sorry, such that you are now encoding information into yeah, encoding information like important information across all your data so if, if we have something like this if i using an rna for this once this card as the proctor started the clock we'll start from us encode information from us into d encode these two information that we've gathered into proctor encode all this information into started Encode all this information into D. Encode on, like we'll keep on going like that. Like at the end of the day, to predict there, we would have gotten enough context from a lot of words that have come before it. So, um, so let's take an example. So, you could have. The input sequence could be larger than this, but I think because of space, they were only able to use four words for, they were only able to use four words for their example. Uh, okay, so here we have the student open there. Don't forget, the student, we're, use, we're trying to predict the next word after the student open there. So what do we do? That's like a neural language model. You obtain the embeddings for the students open there. Yeah? Then you okay. So first of all, you start with a an initial hidden state because you cannot just start from you can't just start from um, you can't just start um, computing your hidden states from like the first word 
you have to like initialize it based on something that's like you could you could be you could initialize it randomly or you could you could initialize it with zeros. So H naught H zero is our initial hidden state. So how do we compute our um, subsequent hidden states? We compute our subsequent hidden states by a linear transformation on the previous hidden states, on this previous hidden states, and your current input. This is your current input. So to compute H one, this hidden state. Don't forget that. Is the hidden states that are encoding this information that we're talking about. So you so to, to get the hidden state of H, this H1, you compute a linear transformation on H0 and your current input. If you see here, so your current input is your embedding. This is so let's say this E1. So if you see here. So like, like I said for neural language models before, you can either initialize your word embeddings randomly or you could use pre-trained word embeddings. So if you see here, we we'll multiply a weight by this previous hidden state. Then we add a, we we'll also multiply a weight by our current input. That's this embedding that we have. This embedding is our current input. Don't forget, you cannot throw D like that into our, um, model we have to represent it the way in the way the computer will understand so you you multiply a weight by your previous hidden states add that to um add that to your embedding multiplied by its own specific weights and then you add a bias and then you go on like that. So after calculating H1, to calculate H2, so after calculating H H1, to calculate um, to calculate H2, you use just H1, knowing that H1 already has information from H0. So calculate H3, you use H2. So you can see how the information is being passed like this, encoding information like this into this um, final hidden state. So yeah, these are final hidden states. Mm. Okay. These are final hidden states. So you can either use your final hidden states to make prediction. So knowing that so we're assuming that this is our final hidden state though. It already has information of every word that's come before it in your text. So let's say you have a, a text of 500 words. If you're 200, if, if you want to predict a word at your 200 hidden states, you assume that that 200 hidden state already has information from the previous 199 words that's come before it. So you assume that ah, that hidden state is very, very rich in information. So you use that just that hidden state to predict the next word. So some people do that, or some people can, you can decide to concatenate all of the hidden states to make your final prediction. So while um, RNN language models um, important, I mean, what are the advantages? Because we can use it on like our n-gram language models and our neural language models. We can use it to process any length input. And then we use the information from many other steps that have come before it. Also, your model size does not increase for longer inputs. Because you have the same weight that is a Every time step in symmetry. So like your model size does not increase at all or if you have long fields. But that one is advantage with RNNs. The computation is very, much you have one million words. You know, a way to compute, what, um, compute um, to get information from all the previous words that, even words that are not even important. You will chop like, and then eventually 
it will be hard to assess if it's one that has come before you have one million words so yeah say you have a sentence um so you have a sentence let's go to this now this is our previous uh this is our previous uh um example the doctor where is that hey this is our previous example so let's assume that this as the proctor started the clock. It has maybe that's the first sentence in your data. And then the students open there is like maybe the hundredth occurrence or maybe the one one million occurrence in your data. How do and the, the rights we need this particular um we need this um no we need this context to make prediction for this particular um instance how do we now assess it like obviously it has taken a lot of information like a lot of important and unimportant information so that it's now difficult for you to even go and say that okay i need this information that you collected about as the, about on the proctor i need it now like it will, it will be hard for your model to go and start looking for ah where is it where is it ah, is in the first sentence so yeah let's go back it's very very hard so that's one problem that's the problem with rnn it's good or it works so but because you have because typically your models need, need very large data to train to to be to to work well so you have very large data it will be very hard to assess information that has come before so how do you train a language model? So as usual, you have a, a big corpus of text with a sequence of words. So you feed into your RNA language model. You feed this um, text into your RNA language model. And you compute the output distribution Y for every step T. So that's predicting probability distribution of every word given so far. So like here now, we have our outputs, uh, output Y. Output, output. Have our output y. So you take this um, hidden, this um, hidden state, and use it to predict your output two. You take this hidden state, and use it to predict your output um, three. Like you go on like that. So your loss function here is the. So we can this can like we can see this as sort of like a classification problem. So that given this, you are trying to predict this. Given this, you are trying to predict this. Given this, you are trying to predict this. So loss function on, on each step is the cross entropy between the predicted probability and the true next word. So let's say, yeah, we're supposed to predict, it's supposed to be D open their exams. So imagine we didn't predict exams. We predicted books, which is wrong. In this context, I say yes. Now you the, you get the um, the negative log likelihood. So it just of the um, the of what you predicted of what you have predicted. Let's say you predicted books. So you get of the the loss of what you predict of books in comparison with what you should have rightly predicted. So you do this for like your overall um, this thing. For the entire training set, get your overall loss. So you, 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 so you compute this like over each time step. Just don't forget trying to predict. But you know, so it's even exactly depending on what application you are using your RNN for anyways. If you are using it for like tech generation, like in this case. So the loss over the loss over J2 is the uh, is what what you've predicted in comparison to the actual prediction. So it goes on like that. So we understand that. At the end of um, at the end of the day,
at the end of the day, yeah, to the to um because each hidden state is dependent on each other, to compute the the um to compute the the to do back propagation, you have to derive your overall loss with respect to these individual losses and hidden states that you have. So at the end of the day, like we have overall loss of total loss of all everything that have uh, all your um, all the occurrences in your data. So we now have to so don't forget that if you have 500 words, your last hidden state will be the 500 hidden states. If you are completing your loss, you have to start from that 500 hidden state. So let's say you, you, you want to, let's say your model predicted um, um, the church instead of students. To compute the loss over this, you are going to, like, you, you, you have to start computing your back, back, back for, compute, deriving your loss from the 500 hidden states until it gets to this second hidden state. And that is very computationally expensive. Like it's too computationally expensive. Yeah. So um, we know that, I don't know if you guys have touched stochastic gradient descent, but stochastic gradient descent um, in the form of bad gradient descent that allows you to compute your loss and gradient over like very small data and updates. So like over like every example, instead of waiting for you to compute all your um, compute the loss over all of your data, then now starts to um, update the weights. You do it after each example. So for RNNs, for for RNNs, you can you can update your um, this thing your hidden state. You can update weights of it based on the one that's come after it. So you know that when, when we're trying to um, compute, when we're trying to, um, when we're doing forward propagation, we're going this way. But we're going this way. We're going this way. So here we can compute this, the, um, we can update this weight, this weight based, on, based on just this, um, this thing. What's it called? This uh, hidden state. So it comes from here. So these are, let's say these are final hidden states. So it goes from here until it gets to your, um, what's it called? To your first, um, to your first initial hidden states. So this is basically how, like, how do you calculate like the total, the total, um, how do you calculate the, how do you derive your, your um, loss with respect to Whatever hidden state, remember to the weights of your hidden states. So you have over time steps, over so over time steps. Uh, they are starting from here, and then you sum the gradients as you go. So you are progressing through like over this time step, and then you you um, accumulate the gradients as you go until you get to whatever um, whatever weights that you are interested in. So how do you generate text with your an RNN language model. So it's just like an engram language model, yeah? So it's an R you can use it to generate text by sampling repeatedly. So here, given, so we have our initial, don't forget, we have our initial hidden states. We initialize it with zeros or we initialize it randomly. So our first input is mine. So it takes information from this initial hidden state and predicts, you sample and predicts favorites. So it has encoded information from my. So our next, your next um, input will be favorites because we're doing text generation. Text generation, you're generating text based on what has come before. So your next input will be favorites. You predict season. It's encoding information as it's going. Your next input will be season to predict is. It's encoding information as it's going. Your next input will be spring, will be is to predict. Um, Spring. It's encoded information as, as it's going. So let's see an example of generating text language model. 
So I train an RNN language model on any kind of text. So this is an example of an RNN language model that was trained on Obama speeches. Um, the United States will step up. So, so they collected like all of, let's say all of the speeches that Obama has ever um, written in his entire career, and they now put the language model on it. Um, intuitively, your model, the type of model should predict should be in the style that Obama talks. So your model paints a lot of things from just over Obama speeches. So here you can see the United States step up to the cost of a new challenge of the American people and the fact that we created the problem, they were this and this and this and this and this. Now see that it's quite coherent. You can see the um the United States the United States um information that that is in this generated text. This is another example. Someone trained the RNA language model on Harry Potter. The big thing about, about training this kind of language is that like they learn um styles in how like your data like how you how your data looks like. Like if, if you train a model on Shakespeare, it will generate data in that same format, in that same Shakespeare and um, books, like on plays, generate short sentence like in that same format see something a language model on recipes you can see what the output looks like it has a title it has like it might not, i mean for it might not it might not really make sense but it learns style like it learns style in from the data that has been trained on text um, colors, text of colors. So I think um, this language model was trained on paint color names, yeah? And then I was able to generate some very, very funny, um, funny um, names. So here they use character language, character RNN. Character RNN is just predicting it. So instead of using predicting words, they are predicting next letters. So you can use that to generate text to like large text. So how do you evaluate language models? So there's something called perplexity. That is the evaluation metric for language model. So it's basically the um, the inverse probability of your of your corpus, like inverse probability of your whole corpus according to your um, what's it called? This is your language model. So it's the product of all probability of, um, of or probably is it by the number of words that you have in your data. So usually like you should have a a lower perplexity for for your I don't I don't quite know an estimate. Uh but if you have a lower perplexity, that's something you could check out. Like I don't know quite know the right um the right um perplexity number value rather but it should be low and it's and it's dependent on like the amount of data that you have but RNAs have been recorded to have um lower perplexities. So you can see this n-gram language model. Perplexity is 67.6 and this. But with RNNs, this is 7.6. But RNNs, the, the perplexity reduces. So why, why should we... So if we've finished talking about RNN, we're wrapping up on language modeling. So why should we care about language modeling? Because language modeling is a task that makes us measure progress on understanding language. Basically, for every NLP task that you would do, you are going to model whatever text that you have, whatever language that you have. So like you say here, it's a, it's a sub-component of many NLP tasks, especially those involved in generating text or estimating the probability of text. Predictive typing, speech recognition, handwriting recognition, 
um, machine translation, summarization, and dialogue. So just a recap of what we've talked about so far. Language model is a system that predicts the next word. Recurrent neural networks is a family of neural networks that takes sequential input of whatever length you have, applies the same weight on each step, and can optionally produce outputs on each step. Recurrent neural network is not equal to a language model. Recurrent neural network can be used to train language models, but they're not equal to language models. Recurrent neural network can be used for like a lot of different other things. <coughs> We've shown that RNNs can be used can be a great way to build language models, but names are much useful for other things, not just language models. So can use RNNs for part of speech tagging. So we know what part of speech tagging is. Given a word, you predict the part of speech. So here, C, D, predict statutes. With cats, you predict that it's a noun. Oh, that is for sentence classification. So you encode all of the, so you have overall, I enjoyed this movie a lot. You want to predict, so like you, this guy asked earlier um, about sentiment analysis. So this is an example of sentiment analysis. So overall, I enjoyed the movie a lot. She, is this a positive sentence or a negative sentence? A positive sentence, yeah. So how do you, so the, yeah, this is our target, yeah. So there are different ways to do it. You can either encode all this information and then use your last leading states to make predictions. Or you um, take the element wise max. Or, so, like the element wise max is like probably the highest, uh, the hidden state that has the highest value. So, you can of all your hidden states and use that as. Find the middle of all your hidden states, you get one value. So you use that value to predict output. So you can use RNNs as encoders. So encoder encoder the applications are used in um, applications like question answering, machine translation. Applications are used in question answering, machine translation, so that you have. Um, language you have you put an answer another task so you can use rnn rnns in um coders so rnn language models can also be used to generate text like we have seen okay it's in speech recognition okay it's for um machine translation and summarization Um, yeah, so the RNN that we've talked about here is called vanilla RNN. Um, so there are other variants of RNN, um, GRUs, gradient recurrent units, and then um, LSTM, long short term memory, um, long short term memory networks, and multilayer RNNs, even bidirectional bi RNN that are uh, that work better than vanilla RNNs. Um, so these other RNN variants are important because they help to solve the problem of. So you know, remember this problem where we said that um, computing uh, this thing. Um, where is it? Uh, just a second. Um, comp recurrent computation of our hidden states is very slow, and then it's usually difficult to assess information from your previous time step. So what is most of these variants, these LSTM variants do is help to um, help to check in for that, help to improve on that, yeah? So we can't take that today because it's it's another lecture on its own, um, but we, we'll, we'll take that next week. So next week, I'll try to 
cover this other LSTM variant. Oh, okay. I think what I'll do is I'll try to. So we'll go to a notebook, a collab session. We'll use um, LSTM um, RNNs to generate text. Yeah. We'll go to a collab session first. Oh, okay. So what we'll do is like, what we'll do actually is we'll first talk about this RNN variant and they would have a code lab session where we would use um, RNNs to generate Shakespeare um, text. Or RNN trades on Shakespeare, Shakespeare text. We use it for text generation. Yeah, I think um, I think I'm done. Uh, I know it was I I assume I might be wrong that it was quite overwhelming. But um, if you have any questions, I'm willing to answer. Oh, I, think I should go back. Let me just go back to slide. So, do you have any questions? Uh. So is there a possibility like we, of getting the notebook for next class before the class? Maybe you just go through it and try your luck. The is it the um the for the code lab session? Yes, yeah, yes, of course. Lab, it's lab, it's okay. online. I'll um is there there's a Slack group for this class, yeah? Yeah, there is. Okay, I think I'll just in fact let me just even check it. I'll just open it on. Mm, I'll just copy the link. I'll just copy the link and paste it in this. Well, we've been working with PyTorch, does that matter? Oh, you want me with PyTorch? Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I would find a I'll find a PyTorch. <laughs> okay. That's Stanley's work. Yeah. yeah, let's find it. PyTorch. This was this is what I would have used anyways. But let's find a PyTorch tutorial. Oh, this one you can just directly connect it to Collab. Uh, okay, you know what? I have to copy all this. Too. You know what? So I'll prepare a notebook in PyTorch. Yeah. Because all the tech generation notebooks I have are I'll tens of I'll put a notebook in PyTorch. I'll try to do that. Stan, please, can you remind me? I'll, I'll try to do that this uh, weekend, between now and Tuesday or Wednesday. Between now and Wednesday, you should get it. Before then, share, you should get it. I'll put a notebook um, for, in PyTorch. Yeah, and then send it to Stanley. So you send it to you guys. Is that okay? Who asked the question? Oh, hello. Thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, so, um, okay, let me just put the link. Let me just Put the link, send it, put the link to this uh, slide here in case you want to go through it. Yeah, so I put a link to this slide there. 
so um so next week we'll continue from we'll continue from lstms sorry what about, what, about the first, what about the first slides okay uh okay sure mm. This is one on word vectors. This one is just, I don't think you need this, all this one. This is just introductory stuff. Those two that I sent are good. Those are like the two main, two, yeah, those are like two main slides that we use for the class. And then it will also be good to go through the the next, so for, for the next class. But I think I'll send the I'll send the link to the next class along with the notebook. Yeah. I'm trying to find it now. The link to the slides for the next class. I'll send it along with the notebook. Yeah. So um Stanley. Yeah, I'm done. Oh. Yeah, I can hear you. Hello? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, let's just sit down. Okay, thanks for a lot. So, like, does anyone have any questions at all? Is any part that is confusing? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so yes. um, please yes, I can. Com comparing RNA to, to the previous two um, models or ways of training um, language, language networks, is there any disadvantage of RNA? or advantages of those or that to have it in? That's a question. Please, please, can you give me a second? Just a second. Okay. Um, sorry, just a second, please. I'm trying to settle something here. Can you ask your question again? Yeah, I was trying to ask that comparing Ingram neural language model and RNA, uh, it's there a possibility for neural language model and Ingram to have some advantages over RNA? Yeah, you're breaking, sorry. 
Maybe I should just type. I guess my network is bad. Okay, can you type it? I can say it though. He was asking the um the advantage. Okay, what? The he, advantages asking, of. No, he's, he's asking is there possibilities um are there possibilities that the neural method and the engram method have advantages more than RNN? No, in this um in this in these times no because uh rnn in fact if rnns are not even more state of the art uh, methods we have stuff like attentions and um, this thing this is because rnns and um other models like attention models have proved to to outperform by far all these previous engram language models and um neural normal neural language models like if you are if you are working if you are if you want to optimize performance if you want very good results then you would want to use rnns than use those other ones yeah because with rnns you get you get better results yeah so why would you want to use the other ones so the other ones don't have they don't have any they don't have any um significant advantage in my own view i might be wrong because if you if you if, if you if you are following through the lecture, you, you see that we're as we're progressing, we're comparing the advantages of the preceding of the subsequent ones by the, the disadvantages of the preceding ones. And you see that the advantages of the subsequent ones, like RNNs, like you see that neural language models performs would give us but will give, give us better results than the um um Engram language models, and you see that RNNs gave us better results than the neural language models. If it, I don't know if we you noticed it in this slide, but we when we used um, Engram language models and neural language models to predict um, this thing, to predict um, the next word for the students opened there. They predicted books, but when we used RNNs, it predicted exams because they're taking information from the proctor and clock and all that had come before it. You understand? So it is wise to use state of the art um, models or implementations like RNs and so. Okay, you're yeah, welcome. Yes, yeah, okay. so if you have any other questions, yeah, I'm on Slack, like I'm on the Slack channel. You can just text me. And if you're interested, if you're also interested in working on NLP projects, just text me. Um, I'll I'll be ready to. I'll be I'll be happy to guide, advise, whatever you need on them. Yeah. If you have any questions about the class, you can slack me too. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're yeah, welcome. Okay. Um, okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Then, uh, okay, yes, yeah, so I was going to talk about projects too. Um, that's our, our project because we have like four weeks left. The only issue is that we've not really done much on NLP for us to have an idea of what kind of projects we can solve with using NLP. But if you have any project in mind, you can, like, you can. You can message me on Slack so I will discuss about it too. Then also I have some so what I intend on doing is that I intend on us having like four projects based on the number we, we are so we can split it out two on deep learning for computer vision, two on deep learning for natural language processing. So but I'll 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 keep us updated on it. Then like if um, like as whatever I said, if you have any issues or any question regarding what we discussed today, we can message her to. So, that's it. Does anyone have anything to say at all? Or if there's any questions again before we go? Okay. Then also the slides, so I'll try and I'll put the slides that we can we also can all access on the GitHub page. Okay, there's there is no question at all. I think um we've come to the end. 
So have a lovely weekend, everyone. Okay, you too. Thanks. Okay, bye. Yeah, bye. 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 bye.